um, I think I'll just go straight into it and introduce the Asian uh, AIIB. And first of all, what you need to know about it is that it's a regional based um, international multilateral development bank. And by that, we mean that the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is uh, an Asian based Asian Oceania regional based bank. That's where it was. It, it's, it's intended to um, be active mostly to answer Asia's development issues. So even in its, in the bank's articles of agreement, it mostly targets Asian development. But as it went on, its mandate kind of like expanded to accommodate other issues especially because China was the one that introduced the idea of this kind of bank. And because at the time China introduced this idea, it was starting to open up to engaging with international partners and to encourage connectivity and integration into the global economy and to communicate or interact engage more with globalization and to encourage regions to interact and to support each other. And when President Xi Jinping introduced this idea in 2013, it was for this reason. Like he saw that Asia needed um, to develop, but it couldn't do so on its own as, you know, as, as individual countries or as a region, it needed other aspects. It needed to rely on other areas to bring in other partners to collaborate with it and to partner and to win-win, you know, to support each other because maybe the money is coming from Asia, but then we need resources from another place and we need our companies to invest in another continent. So why don't we have a bank that supports Asian companies going out to other economies and setting up these infrastructure and then supporting these companies in the Asian continent? In that way, they gain something, but we also gain something. So that was the idea. So at the time of um, when the bank's idea started rolling out, more and more countries, about 21 countries, had signed initially on the agreement. And these were mostly Asian countries, Asian and Oceania-based countries. So, um, But by the time the founding articles, the articles of agreement were, were uh, deposited and ratified in 2015, there were many more members. There were 51 members, and not all of them were actually. Asian countries, some of them were um, European countries and others were, and two of them were African countries, which is Egypt and South Africa. South Africa mainly because it's a long-standing partner with China, so as part of the whole BRICS um, thing, and also Egypt because Egypt is a really, it's really a strong Chinese partner on the African country. So it has a lot of um, solid investments from China. And to establish it as a Chinese-led bank, its headquarters are based in Beijing, China. And however, its official languages are Chinese and English, but the working language is English. So this is just to establish that whole globalized um, engagement feeling with with the um, um, international feeling of the bank. So it has many labels, but it doesn't fit within all those categories. It, it has that unique flexibility in that it's regional based. It has the characteristics of a multilateral development bank and also its mandate really sounds like a multilateral development bank. However, it's very international to mimic the mandate of an international financial institution like the World Bank. 
and the IMF in that in in the sense of its membership and the way it's it widespread, so widespread. However, it is China led. The the greatest stakeholder is China in the bank. So it it has these characteristics that are very new that bring to it a very unique dynamic that is very interesting and is a topic of uh, conversation and debate with many um, scholars and observers about its intentions given its nature. Some of its uh, legal frameworks, you can find them at the bank's website. And these include the articles of agreement, the bylaws, it has environmental and social frameworks and risk management frameworks and directives which lay out generally a procedure and principles and you know policy within which the bank can operate. So if you have some time, you can go and take a look at that. And to dive straight into the purposes and objectives and functions of the AIIB, uh, Article 1 of the Articles of Agreement state that the AIIB is, its purpose is to foster sustainable economic development and wealth creation and improve infrastructure connectivity in Asia through investment, mainly in infrastructure. And then secondly, to promote regional cooperation and partnership in addressing challenges of development. And then its functions include promotion of investment for public and private capital in investment, mainly in infrastructure, and um, distribution of resources, and then to mobilize and encourage private investment and to supplement that private investment in case it's lacking in the areas in which the bank is aiming to invest in. And then, its main objectives and these objectives I just gleaned them from just basically what its its policy statements and, and scholarly articles and generally like the statements that have been made by China and also its its partners that its objectives mainly are to complement the existing international financial and multilateral development finance systems, i.e. the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which is the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, these kinds of banks through partnerships and cooperation, and to provide alternatives for finance to its member states, and then to focus on infrastructure and connectivity between economies, and to foster integration and remove barriers of trade through providing finance, and then to mobilize resources to do our with financing bottlenecks. For China, as, as the originator of this idea, it also it has its own implications, its own concerns, and its own objectives, mainly China saw that the traditional uh, international financial investment institutional system was not um, evolving fast enough to accommodate the present nature, changing nature of the global economy, because the world now has many more very emerging, powerful, developing economies who are seeking for more resources and more finance and seeking to participate more substantially in the international financial governance system. However, the traditional system doesn't really allow them to do so in, in a way that is really um, substantial because it has most mainly been monopolized in the, in the traditional system of there's a donor and then there's a recipient or there's a financer and a recipient, uh, a credit and a borrower. Usually this, this is what has the traditional system has been like or maybe the most of the power and the decision making power and the voting power in the old Brit Britain Wood system is mostly based with the Western countries and the uh, 
developing countries just receive and then modify their economic situation to fit within the rules set by the you know the world bank and the imf and this process has been making it much more difficult for for these developing countries like african countries who have unique needs to develop fast enough so they need to first conform and then develop yet the world needs now for these countries you know to be supplied finance and to continuously evolve in accordance with the changing system so china felt that as an example of developing countries in need of this kind of new innovation innovative system of finance they needed to introduce something new and then also china's own internal internal overcapacity in construction was providing them with too much revenue that couldn't be used internally like they were overproducing so they needed an outlet they needed to take the product of the internal infrastructure outside of the internal construction industry outside and to start developing instru- infrastructure outside to use up all that material they were already over producing internally because for them they've reached a state where their infrastructure system is really advanced and they have too much of these products already and too much labor and too much know-how internally so they saw that they need to give their construction companies like bigger market and then it would also give these companies in the long run new lending sources and it would help them go out there access new markets become competitive globally learn the rules of operating globally like the west and then because of how china had been operating globally it had already been taking up so much debt from all manner of countries so it was it has very large foreign exchange reserves however it had not really known how to use its foreign exchange reserves and it was making really bad loaning decisions and these loans weren't bringing weren't being you know fruitful they weren't being used fruitfully so it needed a way of sharing the risks of investment and learning how to lending practices from a more internationalized setting so by having international participation it could borrow knowledge from like european countries that had already a lot of knowledge in lending to countries um low uh, cre- low credit countries like in africa however they could also use the opportunity to spread out the risk but control the decision making process and also in the long run the AIIB could be seen as a way of internationalizing the RMB the renminbi which is the currency of China however right now this goal i don't think would will be really achieved in the short run i think it's a long term goal because they still operate in dollars the the article is still lay out that the currency the official currency of shares of of lending is dollars but they also do allow lending and dispersing loans in countries in the country the member states currency and yeah and basically the aib is just a way for china to answer to have an answer to the world bank something that is reflective of the transformation of their own economy and their own growing position as a, a powerful country in the global you know in the global setting and they were and finding participation substantial enough in in the world bank so the chinese government wanted to have its own um targeted alternative to financing and to uh, lending uh we can also look at the composition and membership and governance structure briefly and according to article 3 of the articles of agreement membership to the bank is open to all sovereigns and particularly mentioned are members of the IBRD which is a world bank 
and the Asian Development Bank. So this kind of like is a nod to like um, entering, um, including everyone else within the fold of the AIIB and also kind of like a power sort of, I don't know, standoff between two of its greatest rivals, at least who they see as rivals in these two institutions, the World Bank, the US, and then the Asian Development Bank, Japan. Japan is the largest stakeholder in the Asian Development Bank, and then the US is the largest stakeholder in the World Bank. So, And these two countries have still up to now refused to enter membership in the AIIB. I think it's it's mostly like a political thing, but anyway, um, that is kind of like the interesting dynamic there. And yes, like we said at the time of signing, the bank had 51 members, and these yeah, and these members are the ones who are called founding members. So in the membership has four categories: regional members members who are in the Asia and Oceania uh, regional geographical uh, grouping. And the top five shareholders in that category include China, which has the largest shares, 30% shares, therefore 26% voting power. India, which has 83,673 um, shares, is about, um, about 8% of the shares and then Russia, Korea and Australia. And then it has non-regional members, international members. And these ones, the top five shareholders are Germany, France, Brazil, the UK and the UK. Yeah. And then the founding members are the ones who are the initial signatories of the articles of agreement in uh, 2015 and then prospective members these are people who have put in the articles but haven't uh, haven't yet really ratified the articles of agreement there are 18 countries 18 member countries who are prospective members basically a quick run through another quick run through of the governance system so it has a board of governors it has who are representing each member state and then board of directors to whom um, tasks of the Board of Governors can be uh, delegated, some of the tasks, and these are 12, so nine regional members and three non-regional, and then a president, a vice president, then senior management team, and then an international advisory panel. So on that advisory panel, of course, I put uh, Dr. Angozi. She was the former finance minister of Nigeria and the former managing director of the World Bank. So she's, yeah, she represents the African, I think the African continent probably. Anyway, what is also very interesting about the AIIB is that at the time of its introduction was, I mean, its proposal was also the time of the proposal of the Belt and Road Initiative. So Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping introduced the two at the same time. And um, the objectives of the AIIB and the BRI are almost aligned and intersect. So you, when you read into their intentions, you can kind of like glean that, that, that idea that they were brought into being for almost the same thing, which is mostly infrastructure connectivity and part of the objectives of the BRI is to integrate the financial system and to diversify financial options for uh, infrastructure development and connectivity so you can kind of see that they, they, their ideology and their um, uh, the, just the idea for them is almost the same however as uh, Mr. Jin Li Chin, in he he had an interview and he kind of like straightened out that the two, despite being very similar and despite being China led, are independent of each other. So they 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 operate differently. 
the AIIB has a more international character in its governance system than the BRI. The BRI, its policy is mostly dependent on, on China, but the AIIB, its policy is dependent on the articles of agreement and the decisions made by the board of governors or the board of directors in accordance with the rules of the AIIB. So, however, it's kind of interesting because China is still the largest stakeholder. It still holds the highest number of voting powers. You can kind of like interpret it the way you want to interpret it, despite there being those kinds of rules. But yeah. And then also a brief introduction of its place in the international law, international financial system, and its relationship with the Bretton Woods system. The AIIB in, um, published a document called Rule of Law of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and kind of like gives you a gleaning of, of the international law relevant to the AIIB, which was really um, very progressive of them. It says that the AIB's international character is evident in its articles of agreement that it is, as it's signed by sovereign states, it's therefore governed by public international law and rules, practices, and norms of the international financial systems. And under Article 45 of the bank, the bank has full legal personality to contract, acquire, and engage in legal proceedings. Therefore, the bank does enter into uh, contracts and agreements with sovereign states and international organizations and other multilateral development banks. And the bank specifically entered into a headquarters agreement with China, which is kind of like an agreement that countries that house international organizations have to sign to acknowledge the legal status, privileges, and immunities of that organization. So it shows that this organization is independent. It's almost like a nation of itself inside another nation. It's like an embassy of sorts within another nation. So though that nation's um, policies and laws cannot affect the decisions of this organization. So these two documents, the Articles of Agreement and the Headquarters Agreement, are both registered under the UN Secretariat um, in accordance with the UN Charter. So that kind of gives you an idea of how independent the AIIB is from China itself. So it kind of gives confidence to its member states that it will not have to compromise uh, on anything and bow to Chinese interests and values over those of the bank itself. And in addition to integrating the AIIB into the international um, situation, it is registered as an observer under the UN, uh, UN General Assembly. And Article 31 of the Articles of Agreement stipulate that the bank stands on the principle of non-interference in the internal affairs of its member states and that it maintains independence in decision-making process and only economic considerations are the criteria for financing projects and not political ones. And the international character of the bank is also, and the um, cooperation angle, partnership angle is also more established through uh, partnerships with international organizations that can be approved by its board of directors. So it has entered into several agreements and partnerships with very many um, international financial organizations like the uh, uh, World Bank and also the International Financial Corporation and also the African Development Bank, actually. So it partners with other banks and, yeah, it can... It shows the internationalized quality and its willingness to participate internationally.